I want to hear about your experience designing sound systems, like you know, either for outdoor use or for man ray, or you know, for a small underground event, where you know, like what what do you need to know from event organizers or or companies before you decide? All right, I'm going to bring this gear. Right. Okay. Um, the main thing is to to know what the venue. Um, looks like, they're just the layout of it. Uh, how high are the ceilings, how wide are the walls, how much square foot it is. Then the second most important thing is find out how many people you want to cover. Because um, that kind of really dictates what equipment you're going to bring in there. The uh, type of event also matters. You mentioned a uh, small underground party. Mm -hmm. um, don't bring anything fancy, don't bring anything expensive, and don't worry about it sounding good because you might have to get your stuff out of there very, very quickly or your stuff might get you know, impounded. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so don't bring anything too fancy. Uh, the differences between, say, when I do, do an install versus a festival PA, um, different kind of equipment and a different way it's rigged. The equ equipment itself is built to handle things differently, whereas equipment that I'm bringing to a festival or shows is more weatherized, uh, and it's made to be portable, so it'll have handles on it and, and so on. Install equipment, you're basically hanging it from the ceiling. This is how you rig it. Um, but basically, like, uh, for example, for the install for Man Ray, um, we looked at, this is the square footage, these are the ceiling heights. I don't know if any of you have been there. There's two really, really varying ceiling heights by almost 12 feet. Um, so that posed a challenge of how we're going to cover everything and not have different reflections back and all that. We also set up that room to do live music. So that was another um, consideration um, to take into account when we were doing that. Uh, so we basically said, okay, these are where speakers would fit. That dictates the, the style of speaker, the size of the speaker. Um, and its physical parameters. And we kind of knew going in, we're, I was looking at two companies. Um, I was looking at DNB. I'm, I'm a huge DNB fan. Um, and then we were looking at, uh, what was it? Um, Fal Falcrum Audio. Uh, it's some folks that um, uh, left EAW and went to that. Um, so that, that's one of the things. For outdoor festivals, again, what's the lay of the land? How many people? How much do you want to cover? And where are the neighbors? Um, so in a nightclub, you don't really have to worry as much about sound mitigation. Um, but if you're doing outdoor shows, you really, really want to know where your neighbors are. I've done a number of festivals where I was hired just to figure out what's the best way to point the speakers, what particular frequencies to cut because you're resonating like the side of a cliff, um, that kind of thing. So you kind of take those factors in uh, and think, OK, I, I know I, I can't go over a certain uh, SPL level for my subwoofers. I'm not going to bother bringing 12 of them out. I'm going to bring six of them. Um, so those are just kind of some of the factors that uh, you use when you're, you're designing that type of PA and then deploying it. Um, it gets a little even crazier, too, because outdoors, as the temperature and humidity changes, your sound will carry further, and you'll lose certain frequencies. Uh, so you'll find yourself EQing the system differently different times of the day uh, to compensate for that. But that's, that's one of the larger festivals. If you know a little little uh, party out in the park or whatever, a couple powered speakers on sticks, and everybody's having a good time. Is there some basic math that you can do about like the work that the person you're, you're, you're taking? Yes, and I find that it uh, depends on the style of music you're trying to reproduce. So um, for general just dance party kind of thing, um, I, I generally use the formula of uh, 10 to 20 watts per person. Now, watts is a really, really, really bad way of measuring sound. Um, you have peak output watts, you have average watts, you have RMS watts. Uh, so if you, you know, if you go into an um, electronics store or whatever and you see a $200 speaker and it says 10,000 watts, yeah, that's 10,000 watts for a millisecond before it blows up. It is capable of doing that much power, but just once. Whereas a professional audio amplifier or powered speaker will generally be rated um, in the average peak. So yes, you can get that level, but generally divide it by half for your average program material that's going through it. So if I have a thousand watt speaker, I'm probably going to get average of 500 watts out of that. So you have like basic plastic equipment you have it. Yes, and the way that that watt is generally measured um, is using uh, one meter. Uh, a measurement microphone one meter away and one watt at one meter is how they come up with the sound level rating for that. And it's either done with a sine wave or pink noise. Um, so sine wave is really cheating because the amplifiers only has to do one thing, doesn't care about its duty cycle really. 
Um, pink noise is uh, just weighted white noise. Um, and that is generally a better representation of program material uh, going through PA. So a lot of times you'll play pink noise through to set your levels um, for some bigger shows. If I want to make sure I don't throw a circuit breaker, just for a couple seconds I'll run the PA at the volume that uh, we're going to run the show, or actually a little higher than we normally run the show at, just so I can see how much power is this drawing. If I'm on a generator, is the generator struggling? Um, that kind of thing. So you say 10 to 20 average watts. And, is, and how does that vary, like, indoor to outdoor? Roughly. I know that then you have, like, very specific, right? Like, if you're doing it for friends and family. So indoor, you can generally use the room to your advantage. Um, you can put a subwoofer in a corner. And this is probably going to go away from what we wanted with this. But uh, if you put a subwoofer in a corner, you're going to get 3 dB more output out of it, generally, at a certain frequency range that that um, corner is reflecting in. Outdoor and free space, you don't have that. However, um, for high frequencies, outdoor and free space, I don't have to worry about high frequency like splatter on a wall reflecting back. So there's advantages and disadvantages to doing that. Oh, so in, when you're outdoors, there's no cancellation, so actually you get a bit more power. Generally, yeah, you're not reflecting off of anything unless you're you know, in, a, in the woods and you're hitting a bunch of trees or um, if there's a structure nearby that your speakers are going to hit. Like, um, just, I did the um, uh, Somerville Open Studios alley party uh, last Saturday. Was two did, yeah, three days ago. <laughs> um, and uh, we're in, a, in an alley, and uh, the PA I brought was a very directional uh, PA, but you can still, we're going up against a brick wall. You can just hear the high frequency bounce back. Mm -hmm. um, generally, for low frequency bounce back, if enough people, they'll absorb those frequencies. People don't absorb high frequencies as much. So if I start a sound check and I have all kinds of low end kickback, I'm not really happy with that, all of a sudden 500 people show up, that disappears. And you kind of compensate for that, too, depending on how many people you're expecting when you're tuning the system as well. Huh, I'm actually surprised what, what you just said, that, the high that people don't absorb high frequencies. Not as much, but generally also your um, tire. Right, uh, that's why we get it over their heads. Yeah. Right, yeah, okay, so, okay, yeah. What's your opinion on function one? Oh boy, I might start some fights with that then. <laughs> um, <coughs> Function one is a great PA if you're using it for a particular type of dance music. The cabinets are physically built so they don't require that much EQ, and they're designed for with a genre in mind. If you take a function one PA uh, and you try to put a live band through it, you're going to have a bad day. Um, a lot of the function one um, came from a company called TurboSound out of England. And they, most of it was modeled after the floodlight PA. Uh, and they did some minor tweaks and all of that and changed the design of the cabinet to actually EQ it such that you don't have these harsh frequencies um, in dance music that you don't want. But in a band or other type of music uh, playback, you want those frequencies. So it's very, very rough to mix anything like a, a live music on a Function 1 PA. Uh, if you want to see that firsthand, Big Night Live um, in North Station has one. Um, go see a concert there. Or don't, I guess. But That's other guess. than that, again, for certain types of music, it's fantastic. I mean, they really do a lot of engineering in it. They're also very, very set in their ways. But it's not a multi-function PA, which is kind of which they call it function one because <laughs> it's <a> function. <laughs> uh, but as far as these days, uh, speakers that you can get for bang for your buck, um, I would start with Electro Voice. Uh, Z series is pretty good. Um, the QSC K series again. Get it, if you can get it used, um, good deal. I'm uh, not a huge, huge fan of the new uh, QSC K2 uh, or the two point series. Um, had a few people bring it to my repair bench and had some problems that you shouldn't have on a three month old speaker. Um, I think some some of the Yamaha stuff is decent. Um, <laughs> Sorry, my favorite brand. Uh, I, I would avoid the, the Behringer, the copy of the Behringer, the Harbinger, any, any of those of Alto. Um, you're going to buy it. It'll sound like garbage, and you'll end up throwing it out and buying something else. So you might as well not buy something twice. If you do decide to do a uh, underground party, say outdoors, and you need a generator, um, don't buy a $100 Harbor Freight generator. Get yourself an um, inverter generator. Uh, like a Honda or something like that, because you will blow your equipment up. 
with a sine wave that a really crappy generator is putting out. How you've seen the, the sound systems change in Boston since you started? Because you've seen it evolve over time, right? I mean, both in your own, um, your own systems and the systems that you're playing on. So, uh, so I, I'm a little bit curious if, if, you know, because this is also partly a history class um, mm -hmm. and, and sort of like, uh, has everything moved to powered speakers at this point or are we still in the situation where we have separate amps? Because that used to be the only way to do things. Right, right. Generally for smaller events, you're always just going to find powered speakers. Mm -hmm. I would say in Boston over the past 20 years, um, there's definitely been venues that have seen the value in having a quality sound system and have invested in that. Um, there's actually quite a few, which is really nice. Uh, as far as the outside of venues, um, the kind of <clears throat> dubstep bass music scene uh, with Hennessy sound coming out, uh, people are carting around these subwoofers that are size of these locker cabinets, and they're really into the infra bass. So they're covering 20 to 45 hertz, 50 hertz, and that's the, the fundamental frequency they're trying to reproduce. Um, so we see a lot of that. Uh, which is really interesting um, just to see folks willing to <laughs> have cabinets that big for certain shows. Um, definitely seeing larger PAs than are needed for venues just because people can. They're, over the pandemic, a lot of audio companies went out of business, so people were able to <coughs> scoop up equipment pretty cheap. I've seen a few companies you know, come and go, and a few of them that did specialize in um, dance events, pretty much those events that they were doing have moved to venues now. Just because it's it's just easier there to bring, um, not to, to have to haul out your own PA. I do see some folks like um, there's a few nights they bring extra low frequency reinforcement to say like Middle East downstairs or something like that. So I, I see that a lot. Um, but again, most of the time, yeah, you're just going to have a couple speakers on on sticks and a subwoofer or two. So it really depends on like you know the size of the event. <coughs> do you use hearing protection on the job? If I'm mixing a band, I generally do not because if I need hearing protection, mixing a band in front of a house 100 feet away from the stage, uh -huh. the people in the front are probably going to sue me. Um, <laughs> so I try to keep levels within, uh, within reason. Also, with certain earplugs, they act as filters, little EQs that you put in your ears. I won't be able to hear the full range of the band. But if I'm at a dance show or whatever, super loud, I will definitely put earplugs. Like one of the festivals I do, um, the average sound volume C weighted, which is accounts for low frequency, is running around 122. This that's not healthy. Two days straight. Now, low frequency yeah. isn't as dangerous as high oh, frequencies. Okay, it's mostly bass. The yeah, A weighted okay. stays under 92. All right. Um, okay. That's generally my uh, my rule. Um, although it's, it's funny you mentioned <laughs> I, I was mixing a metal band um, at a, the festival earlier this year, and I was like, this is far too loud. But the crowd was into it, so I kind of let that slide. <laughs> yeah. Who's responsible for determining the volume of a DJ set? Is it the DJ or is it the sound engineer? Oh, that's a great point. Uh, so uh, when you show up to a show uh, and you talk to the sound person, the lighting person, whatever, and if you're lucky to get a sound check, tell the sound engineer, this is the average volume I'm going to be playing. This is the levels I want. However, with my effects on or if I do any EQ shuffles or whatever, this is how loud it can get. And so you say, okay, this is my average, but this is how loud I can get. If there's a sound technician on site, they set the volume, um, if they care. Uh, so basically work with them, give them the two levels, and de determine uh, that. If you, if you have a sound person that just doesn't hear very well, they may run it too loud. It doesn't hurt every so often to just go out in the dance floor, give a listen. If you think it's too loud and you hear people leaving or they're not standing around the speakers, you can visibly see like people aren't into this, just turn it down a little bit. I think people would have a better experience than that. And then um, same for if you're out on the dance floor and you feel it's not loud enough, don't turn it up. Go to the, the sound person and say, hey, we probably could use a little more volume here. Could I turn this up? Is there, or there might be a good reason they can't. They have a noise ordinance that they can't go over. Um, Mm -hmm. Not around here, but there's some venues, uh, especially in Europe, that will have a sound meter at the back of the room, and they will kill power and fine you if you go over that limit. Is there any limit, official limit in Boston um, for like um, you know club venues? And yes, stuff? it varies uh, and depends who you ask. Okay. <laughs>
I know sometimes it's like unclear on where that volume is supposed to be measured even. Is it yeah. like inside the club or outside on the street? There's right. um, different uh, rules about uh, sound level outside of a building, the number of feet from the building and all that, but there's no real stipulation of how you're measuring it properly. Right. Um, and most of the sound regulations are just not reasonable. Um, for like uh, outdoors, uh, you know, seven o'clock at night, they're saying you shouldn't go over like 65 dB. Well, that's not happening. Our conversation's all out right now. So, <laughs> right. again, it really depends who you ask. Cool. It's great to see cool. so many people interested in DJing. Yeah. A sound engineer can really make your night um, miserable if you don't get on your good side. Just don't, don't, don't be rude or have an attitude to anybody that's working. Um, generally, a lot of folks that work in smaller venues are working two jobs. So they just came off their day job. They just got there. They're tired as hell. They just want to go home. And the last thing they need is, is someone, you know, demanding things or just being difficult. Um, go up, introduce yourself, be like, hey, um, I give a crap about this. I'm happy to be here. Uh, and you just have, everybody will have an overall uh, good experience. Yeah. Cool. All right. Big thanks to Nick.